If Murray had supported the show, I'd be less sick of podcasts. Yeah, there goes. The blubbity blah. The blubbity blah. Sending out good vibes. The blubbity blah. Good vibes. The blah. Good vibes. The blubbity blah. Good vibes. Good vibes. Underneath breaths of deep gratitude and prayers for guidance and protection. And put on a didgeridoo and shamanic drumming track. Shivers or vibrations and stuff like that. Okay, guys, welcome back to the Grammarica Show. Coming at you this week, Joanne DiMaggio talking about the Beatles again. I think she was on the show in the past. Speaking of the past, we got everybody's favorite podcaster, Graham Blast from the past, Dunlop. How's yeah. It going? What's that? How's it going? You're just yeah. aging yourself on something. We were just talking about pre show. Aging Talk myself up. About- of what was it? You were talking Total about- Recall from Arnold's movie, Total Recall, yeah. When I was nine. Yeah. Did you see it in theater? Oh, probably, yeah. I will actually be uh, venturing back to the theater soon for the first time in years. What are you going to see? I'm going to go see the new Dune. Oh, it's coming out. When's that coming out? I think it comes out this Friday, but I'm not going to go see it for a couple weeks. Right. But, so is this like a follow-up uh, book to the like the original movie, then this is this follow-up sort of movie? or Part two. It's part like two? the second half of the first book. Oh, they say, right. I think they're going to end up doing them all from the sounds of it, because I think that actor dude said he's going to, he'll only stick around for Messiah and then he'll be out. But I mean... Anyone who knows the books knows that he'd be out anyway after Messiah. <laughs> he's gonna jump to the next like generation, and it's the kids, and then in the next one, he's a giant fucking sandworm, and then you know, so there's no like space for him to act in any movies after that. It would be passed on to Duncan Idaho would return, of course. And we we're looking at uh, that movie because Maria is one of her her favorite actors. Uh... We're looking for one of the series that he's in right now, or that, and then Dune Two came up. I guess he's in there too. Oh, let me guess, Jason Momoa. No, no. <laughs> hmm. Who is it then? Oh, uh, geez. Now I, I don't know. I can't remember his name. Well, which guy is it? Well, Dune. I don't know. He's he probably doesn't have a huge part in it, but he played in he played in the show. I'll find it. Who played? I'll, I'll find it. Who was main actor in Shannara? He was the main actor in Shannara Chronicles. I never even fucking heard of that. Shannara Chronicles. <laughs> those what? are books that I read in the eighties. Eighties books. Yeah, those are. That's a series that came out from eighties books. The the sword of the Sh- sword of Shannara and the elf stones of Shannara. But the the show, I don't think it did very good. Doesn't sound like a show that would do very good. <laughs> I don't. It does. I mean, if it was. It was like the book. Um, it might have Austin Butler. Austin Butler. Austin Butler. So she likes this Austin Butler. I shouldn't even be talking about this on the show, but um, what would he be playing in Dune Part Two? So if I go to Fred Fred Rutha, is that a character? Uh, what? Maybe. Uh, Fred R- Rautha Rautha. Oh, uh, Fade, Fade Ralpha. Oh, Fade? Fade, is that I, is it? Yeah, I think he's one of the Harkonnens, maybe. Or maybe a Fremen, I don't know. Yeah. Shauna just started the book, so. Yeah, so that's, uh, yeah. I haven't done good. books in a long time. Let me know how that goes. How what goes? The, book? the movie. Oh, yeah, I think it'll be all right. I mean. Like, could I go and see it? Like, even if I hadn't watched the first one yet, or can I watch the first? You'd one You'd want to somewhere? go watch the first one, I think. It's otherwise it's going to be weird. It's just going to. Okay. I mean, well, maybe the movies maybe. are weird from the books already because they've right. made it so you can kind of watch the movie without really what knowing what's going on, or with really knowing what's going on. 
But if you go with someone, because it's like for the first 45 minutes, well, what's going on? What's going on? Because they just leave out so much backstory. But it's all right. Mm. It's not bad. Do they take important stuff out or do they mess around with the plot a lot? Like they well, have been in all these other things? Before. The worst part is they turned uh, Leah Kynes into a chick, which would not have happened in Fremen <laughs> culture, but... I digress. <laughs> Let's not get into the culture war. <laughs> Let's not get into the culture war. It's not like, bad, all in all. I gotta say. Yeah. Okay. Well. Well, I'll find it's out where to watch worse, it. I'm sure it'll get worse as it goes on because it's a very political movie. You know, it's right, like, a, yeah. oh, like fucking bending the evolution of entire races of people to your will. Some of them for slavery. So I don't know how they're gonna. Do Gee, slavery is not even allowed in D and D anymore. So how do you do a movie with slavery in it these days? You can have a slave; they just can't be black. I thought, dude, I, the Gemini, uh, the Google Gemini, uh, won't do pictures anymore. I think <laughs> that's, that's a pretty big backlash. <laughs> to me, people were trying to figure out ways to get it to generate racist images. Well, maybe they should have, you know, did you see who was in charge of that Google Gemini project? No, when I tried the later earlier today, though, they said they've put the image generation on pause. <laughs> That's fascinating. Yeah, the age of the troll, the age the, of the internet, the age of the troll. Well, I mean, it, it sometimes it works in our favor, you know. They they go f- too far with this stuff, and people push back, and they don't they don't uh, like it like that. I like it like that. They don't like it. People are sick of it. I have a synchronicity, but I'm not going to talk about it on this show because it's got to do with the other show, our, our Outlawed Roundup, which we'll be doing, I guess, on Wednesday the 28th, I guess it would be, February 28th, 26th, 27th, 28th, yeah. Um, kind of got to do with uh, one of the topics for the show, so I'm going to save that for the show, but it's pretty mind-blowing in my in my head. You might not think so, but... I wonder if Trudeau will have resigned by then. I don't know. You have a few more days for your prediction, don't you? I thought I had till my birthday. Yeah, so yeah, like you got another birthday, like another two weeks, two weeks almost. Yeah, another two weeks. So I got an email here to read too. If you want, it's pretty funny. A funny email? Yeah, like haha, funny or like? Uh, well, I mean, I guess I might. I mean, yeah, it's pretty funny. All right. So this Let's is from. This is from John from Leeds in the UK, from the UK Posse. Hi, Graham. I got an email from Discord, which I've attached a screenshot of. I am so sorry for discriminating against your calf implants. I should have mentioned that other implants are available, including tits, arse, knob, teeth, eye, toe, question mark. Anyway, I hope you can find it in your heart to forgive me. I imagine the people at Discord are fuming at the way I've treated you. I feel so ashamed bunch of like funny emojis keep up the good work john from leeds <laughs> so he sent, he sent the the discord a screenshot hello graham's calf implants we're asking everyone to choose a unique username instead of using discriminators in their username username calf implants is a discriminator yeah i thought you were kicked off of discord no this is his like he was it's his profile was graham like was Graham's calf implants was his profile. He was in our chat, I'm sure, when we were, when we were, I remember this name. Who would forget? I mean, the discrimination. I mean, I was offended like crazy. I mean, these are real calves, not implants. I mean, that's like, that's like offensive. Isn't that hate speech? That should be hate speech. Call, well, telling I'm, somebody, calling them, telling them they have implants when they don't. I don't think anything should be hate speech. I don't think hate speech should be a real thing that exists. I know, I'm just, you know what I mean? I'm just kidding. So starting March 4th, 2024, Discord will begin assigning usernames to users who have not chosen one themselves. You are receiving this email because you have not chosen a new new username. So he has to change his name. He can't make fun of my calves anymore in Discord. Hmm. <laughs> just make it be ground. I mean, you're kicked off of Discord, so... Or have you made your way back on? No, I'm not going back. No, I don't want to do that. I got Uh, another, I got another email too that I've been procrastinating about. I hope I didn't read it yet. 
You want me to do it now or? Yeah, let's do it. What, uh, is there anything else we have to catch up on? I mean, I got a new gun. Yeah, I mean, we. I guess we could do the gun talk now, and I could do the email after if you want. I mean, I do we it. have to talk about guns on this show? I mean, that might be offensive to some people. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> As it is, we don't talk about medical misinformation, which, you know, it used to be a big topic of the show. I'm not giving up any more ground. I think True. guns are fine, especially now that we're demonetized. Right, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's really just, they don't... Not they don't. that we were ever monetized... <laughs> We just were able to accept the odd super chat that when he says demonetize, we just can't do any of that anymore. But I mean, at this point, it's really, uh, I would consider myself a collector. So <laughs> an archivist. So talk about your, your new gun. That's a, tw- it's like a, a 22, like it shoots small bullets, but it's also like can shoot a lot. You can shoot 115 in the drum mag. 115. And this is not yeah. illegal in Canada. There's no limit on rimfire. So because Wait, it's what's, what is small, rimfire? What is rimfire? Uh, it means it's not a center fire. So most bullets, the fire and pit hits the middle and causes the thing to shoot. So they have, let me see. If I have a easy. No, you probably shouldn't have them hanging around, should you? Or isn't that illegal? Or you're in your gun room right now? I'm in my gun. I'm, I am in my gun room right now. The gun room is also my office. It is also locked with hinges on the inside, which was just a coincidence. <laughs> there might be some more stuff I got to do, but it's close enough, I think, that they wouldn't give me any hassle. I mean, for them to come here, they got to schedule it and stuff, or they need a warrant. They don't have a good enough reason to get a warrant, so they have to schedule in a look, and I'll just cram it all in the safe. The problem is the safe is just full right now. But uh, the guns are all locked, so, I mean, they could maybe try and get me with uh, unsafe storage of ammo or careless storage of ammunition, but it's tucked away in this drawer, not out, so I don't know. They'd have a hard time, especially with me being an Indian. Let's see, this one has the thing in the middle where the firing pin hits. Okay. As would... So what's the difference between that then? And guns, but this one doesn't have it, see? Okay. So this one, the fire and pin hits the side of it. And what what's the difference between that then? Nothing really. It's just the smaller calibers, like my 17 HMR and the 22 are both smaller calibers at a room fire. Dude, I was shooting a 45 cal and drum at, you know, 20 yards with that thing, though. And it goes through both sides and then kicks up a bunch of dirt. I mean, it would go right through you. If you shot a guy within 50 yards, it would go right through him. Well, what, what's so? Why? What's the justification of legalizing some of these things and not others? Or elite? I sorry. think it's more of a justification of making them illegal. You know, that's more what it's been. Is they're just trying to? It's harder to make these illegal because they've got so many of these. There exists so many of these twenty twos with big mags and stuff. You know, I don't know. It's just like. To, that would be harder. Like it would be not it's worth the effort, to, really, because it's it easier to ban the other stuff if you let people have their twenty twos. That's what most people are are sport shooting with. Oh, interesting. I mean, that's why I'm I pick up the twenty the, the twenty two. I'll probably get another one because I only have a couple. I don't have a lot of that smaller stuff, and even the seventeen HMR is like fifty cents or fifty cents a shot. So you don't want to just blast it all day for shits and giggles. Right. But the 22 is cheap as shit. You know, I can buy thousands of them for cheap for, you know, they're 10 cents a piece or five cents a piece. So you can go shoot them all day, you know, dump 30 round mags and not care. Dude, if I dump a 30 round mag out of my um, AR thing, it's fucking 35 bucks, man. It's 30 yeah, just- bucks just to dump the mag. One mag, 35 bucks. But it does seem to be a little bit ridiculous that you can go and put 115 little bullets in a gun and shoot them pretty much very quickly. Maybe not technically automatic, but then they're yeah, banning, probably. banning all these other things. Like, it seems to me crazy. Like, wouldn't that be considered an assault probably weapon? The limited, the limited range, I guess. I know, but is that, like, really, does, should that matter from a legal legality standpoint? Like, oh, it's shorter range, you know? 
I don't know, man. That's you crazy. Out to the wrong guy about. Well, I'm, I'm just I'm bringing going? up these points that probably most people would ask. I uh, that aren't that aren't following it, right? I don't know the details about all this stuff. I'm not a I'm gun a, guy. I've never I'm been a gun guy. Shorter barrel. Are you, are you talking about my height? Are you Boy, insulting yeah. my height? Could I insult it any more than I already have? <laughs> probably not. Graham, the one-breasted dwarf, the shorter barrel. With the shorter, just call me the shorter Dunlop. barrel. <laughs> Graham, shorter barrel, Dunlop, the half pint. Anyway, did you find the email? Yeah, I've got it. Yeah, I've had it all along. This is for an episode. Uh, it's about an episode that we did last. You know what? Why I want to read it now is because it's got to do with Joanne's work too. I mean, Joanne did a bunch of work uh, before on Edgar Casey's stuff and reincarnation. She spent like decades researching this stuff and writing about it. And um, this email is kind of, kind of touches on that. And it's from an episode we did last summer uh, with Michael Rysider. Um, No, sorry. Michael H. R- Ryder. Raider? Ryder. Ryder the second. And it was called protection from the abyss. And it was, he's, he was like a new world shaman and he, and he joined us for a chat about this new energy, the dark forces, consciousness, right, ritual and ceremony. Oh yeah. This was a great show. Turning gin. Like this is about even turning Jim, the society of gin uh, before the angels, his moment with the owls, like manifestation tools. Like we talked about a lot. So this email is regarding that episode. I've never reached out to a host or hosts of a podcast, but your recent guest, Michael Ryder, was pretty spot on. I wish I could come forth about my haunting since my youth, dabbling in sorcery and my dealing with gin. Its nature to my culture and the owl is not a friend. Oh, sorry. It's native to my culture and the owl is not a friend. These ancient beings are shapeshifters and once they attach, it's difficult, if not impossible, to get rid of them. They are a force that should never be tampered with. And you are very wise to be wary. I think I might have read this before. And either way, I'm thinking about writing. I'm wary of owls. Is he talking about me being wary of owls or about the other uh, guest? No, he's just in general. Okay. I'm thinking about writing a book. Owls. There's an owl around here. I don't want to. I ain't, I don't think shooting it's a good idea, but I ain't interested in like looking at it or seeing it or coming across <laughs> it. Inviting like, it. I'm, inviting it closer. Not, I just don't think you're supposed to fuck look. Be around them, you know, in I'm, in Indian culture, they're bad luck. Yeah, right, right. Well, maybe that, maybe she's native. Being around is okay, but you don't want to see them. You don't want to see their eyes specifically. Well, they have very uh, good perception, right? And wisdom. What? I'm wisdom. thinking about writing a book about wait, this. Wait, wait, wait. Wisdom about what? Well, they're owls are wise, dude. Well, I mean, I, they're known as wise. I mean, they're even used in Dungeons and Dragons as like an owl's wisdom as a buff you get. Like, what do you a, think you know, they know? You mean example? They see, they see and hear. They have the best senses of all the, the animals, right? They see and hear everything, so they're wise. What do they know that I don't? <laughs> if you come on, we've done enough shows on owls. There's a there's also this this gin or this genie sort of uh, paranormal aspect to them as well. I think, yeah, there might be something to that, but I'm not convinced that they're wise. Huh. Maybe they're animal wise. Oh, maybe it's, is it, is it, I, am I, do I have it wrong now? Hmm. It seems like a bird of prey. Maybe it's fox. Maybe it's foxes that are the, the ones. I think there's been a fox trying to get in my chicken coop. <laughs> well, you just got all kinds of animals on the property, eh? Well, the bush, there's not a lot of bush in the prairie. So I have the bush and the lake right here, you know, so I really am. And probably other than being over in the foothills of the mountains or, or along the river, we high mm-hmm. animal zone. The novelty is, you know, there's the novelty of hunting and the property and stuff is sort of worn off. I could go hunting, but well, I mean, it'll be fun when I see stuff, but I'm not like crashing through the bush anymore or anything like that. Yeah, I want to shoot something off my deck eventually, or out of my hot tub eventually when I get one. And it's almost bow season, so I mean, I was I got the archery range set up, ready to go. I just haven't started shooting yet because it's decent, but it's not really warm enough, you know, to go 
Once I start shooting, I don't want to stop. And next week already, like it's minus 20 for a couple of days this week. So I ain't going to be out shooting in that. Yeah, it's we're getting bad. back into a winter here. Okay, let me uh, finish this email here. I'm thinking about writing a book about this real life experience, but I'm scared to bring it forth again after a decade of fighting for my soul. I was a gifted child and later more gifted Reiki master. I was attracted to the beauty I felt and tons of spot on psychic visions and incredible healing for my clients, including cancer, depression, and other maladies. I must have awoke something from the past as well as inviting something in. Within a few years of practicing, I became involved with shadow figures and invasive dreams. Mind you, I hadn't had these things for 15 years. Within a few months, my marriage went to hell. My entire family excommunicated me had several car crashes that were inexplicable. My own mind had terrible thoughts that were not of my own making. And I went from being too, too rich and successful to almost homeless. The one thing restoring me now is personal faith and avoiding at all costs new age and even natural or chemical psychedelics. I guess like both of you, I guess I like both of you and wanted to warn you. Be weary and discerning and opening doors and crushing your psyche. No one that is healing knows for sure what they are communicating with. Islam warns that no man must interfere nor trust the jinn, for they, they must live in their own realm despite them, and man disobeying the boundary. Evil does not pronounce itself so. It comes as beautiful and healing at times. If you, if you care to discuss my experience and or know a ghostwriter, no pun intended, happy to connect, but in public I cannot speak of this because of the stigma. I'm finally starting to get back on my feet. Cheers to you both. Cheers, brother. I don't really fuck with that shit. So, I mean, I do do the psychedelics, so. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I find it fat. It's just it, the the more I think about it, the deeper the whole thing goes and the harder it is to really wrap my head around or understand it, really. It's just, it's like, it's almost like there was just, it was something about, you know, the, how the Christianity kind of demonized everything. It's like, almost like there was something about that, but they went too far, you know? Yeah. Well, I know that it just seems like a bad idea for me to get involved with, you know, yeah. when you can do, there's so much just mindset stuff you can do that. It seems like a better idea to do with that, where you can kind of do the, I don't know. I guess I would call it like safe magic. Yeah. Yeah. Where you don't have to worry about getting yourself into trouble. And I mean, maybe there's no trouble in that other sigil stuff, but it just seems like it could be trouble. Seems like those are sort of doorways and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Or you get what you like for a little while and then. Or it comes at a price or that you're making a deal that you don't even know about. There's an exchange of energy or something. Yeah. Whereas I feel like with the the new thought, or at least I don't even know if the new thought is the right thing for it, but the manifestation, the Napoleon Hill style stuff, you know, the real price you're paying is busting your fucking ass. You know, that's what, that's what the superpower turns out to be at the end of the day is, is maintaining a positive attitude because it mostly allows you, I mean, there, there could be a bunch, there could be magic there. There is, I think in my opinion, but even if there's not, it keeps you motivated and working and keeps you concentrating on keeping a positive mindset which in turn keeps you working harder and working towards things and solving problems and right uh, instead of just looking for reasons to give up which yeah. is what most people I'm, seem to be doing yeah i like that yeah or, or getting anxiety ridden or letting that negative sort of thought pattern or, or the anxiety get you down or stop you from actually seeing opportunities or going after opportunities you know yeah I like that. So support the show, guys. We uh, we really can't do this show without you. We need your support now more than ever. Um, of course, that was that show. So what we've uh, done around here lately, if you haven't got the memos, we now mention you guys when you support. If you sign up for a new monthly or make a one-time donation of $50 or more, we will mention you on the show. And sometimes we'll mention the other ones too, just because we want it. So any donation, any month that you're going to get a shout out and uh, you can write a whole note if you do a one-time donation of 50 or more. So we do have a few people to thank this week. Remember, if you've been supporting the show for the while and you're like, what the fuck, man, I never got a shout out. Just email Graham. 
And uh, email <laughs> Graham with shout out, and Graham, we'll, we'll read it on the show. Graham at GrahamAmerica.com. Yeah, that's right. So this week we're going to do a shout out to Keith L. I don't know if I could even pronounce that last name if I wanted. Out in Saskatoon. Wow, really? Yeah. Isn't that Close by. That's fantastic. Yeah, so Keith in Saskatoon uh, signed up for seven seventy seven a month. Thank you, Keith. That's huge for us. And uh, on Patreon, we had Please Sir Don't Touch Me there. We came a $3.33 <laughs> Patreon for us. And then we had a couple donations too. Where did they go? Um, we had there was a there's a no no one of them as well. So it's funny because they came in back to back and they were both for 30 bucks. One for 33. So this one is uh Levi Levi Case. Love the show, guys. Been listening for a while now. Keep up the great work. Also, Darren, you should trap some coyotes and tan them and make some great hats or slippers. I could probably sell those for a fortune on Etsy, huh? Authentic Indian made coyote. Coyote gear? Maybe. Coyote kit? They won't notice that. It's garbage quality. I mean, maybe I could get good at making it eventually, but I've never really done that. Yeah, I feel like that would take a bit of practice. Yeah, you can't just jump into it. And then, uh, shout out to John. John Farmer, who sent us 33-33. And that's, uh, that's about it for this week, guys. I think we could do a little better than that. Head over to GuyAmerica.ca slash support. You guys, we just had that great interview with Adam Curry. I mean, that, that's honestly one of the best interviews I've heard. He's been on Rogan a couple of times. I think we got into some deeper and cooler stuff than they did, especially if you're a No Agenda fan. And I know there's a ton of No Agenda fans out there. So, I mean, you let us know. GuyAmerica.ca slash support. Uh, if you're getting some value from these shows, if you like the interviews you're doing, let us know who to interview uh, as well. If you send that in with some cash, you're probably more likely to get your wish. But either way, support the show, gramerica.ca slash support, guys. Sign up for a monthly or make a one-time donation and get your note read on the show. Um, anyways, yeah, it's important, guys. It's like you could sign up for the monthly on gramerica.ca slash support. That'll get you everywhere. That'll get you to the Patreon, to the Stripe, to the cryptos, to the PayPal, whatever you want to do. Send cash in a book if you want. You know what else, too? There's, uh, there's something Tre- Trevor gave us another shout-out on No Agenda, actually. And uh, I think there's a there's a weird indirect way to support the show too. Like if you hear a guest on here, like for example, you know Joanne, uh, her book on the Beatles that we're going to talk about here. Um, tell them Grey America sent you. You know if you if you if you find some of of our guests' work or you find some stuff, tell them tell them we sent you. That's always a, a way to help uh, support the show as well. Or tell your friends, review the show. There's yeah, all these non monetary ways. Marketing's huge because nobody. We're not, we're like shadow banned everywhere. I mean, it seems like we might be finally starting to bust out of that in some places, but, uh, you know, we're mostly shadow banned. We were getting more traction on YouTube again, but that, I, you know, the roundups are going to fuck that up eventually. <laughs> it's just a matter of time, really. That's, we won't bother monetizing that again. That being said, we do have a monetized YouTube channel. Where you can get our audiobooks for free. Not all of them, not yet, but eventually all of them are sort of trickling out three days a week. You get a video. So sometimes that's three books a week. Sometimes that's one book a week, depending on how long the books are, because YouTube has a 12 hour time limit per video. So some of our big books, they take like, you know, three 12 hour videos just to get them out there. Anyway, the secret teachings, a bunch of them are out there already where you can watch those audio, listen to those audiobooks for free. Um, because they've got ads in them, of course. That's how we generate the revenue over there. But if you're a YouTube premium member, they don't have ads in them. So, uh, and we still get paid based on how often, how long you're listening. So that's a way to get the audiobooks for free. You can't get them all right away. I mean, we were just talking about before the show how it's going to take us like two years just to get the YouTube channel caught up with all the back content of audiobooks we've created. Um, and then we're still creating them constantly, so we we won't catch up for a long, long time. But check that YouTube channel out, guys. Give it a subscribe. Give it a share if you have people in your life that like audiobooks, even if they don't like some of our other content. 
Uh, of course, head over to Outlaw too if you want to check that podcast out. GrandMericaOutlaw.ca or GrandMericaOutlaw in your podcast player that is available on Patreon now. I've got all the episodes caught up and it's now current and being updated currently each week on Patreon, which can be now drug over to Spotify. So if you sign up for Plus over there on Spotify, uh, on Patreon, you can get your extra content on Spotify. And the audio books are slowly going on to Patreon as well. But of course, adultbrain.ca will get you to everything audiobook we do. So there's been some great titles out there lately, some real good ones. Yeah, talking about magic and all that stuff we just talked about. There's one called Moonchild by Alistair Crowley. It's a it's a fiction work, but he's kind of interwoven some some well known personalities from that time into the into the fiction. Um, it's a pretty interesting book. Code of the Illuminati by Abby Barrowell is is out talking about how the Illuminati was structured in the late 1700s. Fabianism and the Empire is out. Uh, Taz, the Autonomous Zone, Ontological Anarchy, Poetic Terrorism by Hakeem Bey. That's that's out on the podcast. Meditations of Marcus Aurelius. So, I mean, these things are all going to come out on different platforms at different times. There's no way to synchronize all of it. Like, they take forever to get out on some of the some of the main audiobook sites, but we can get them in the podcast feed right away. So the benefit of the podcast is you get sort of a choice of more stuff that is that's been there. Um, it's all there and it's there quicker because we have control over that. But like YouTube's gonna be a while for some of these new ones and some of the other places where you would buy them, right? Yeah, and the podcast is the cheapest. So the podcast now is the new price is four bucks a month. So uh, if you guys want to sign up for that, of course, if you guys sign up for the other one, you can just cancel it. If you're like, what the fuck? I signed up at seven, just cancel it and mm-hmm. sign up again. Um, you know, we decided that we have to stay competitive. No one was signing up. So at four bucks a month, maybe we can stimulate more, cons- more, uh, more intrigue. So that's the audiobook side of things. We're trying to fight our way back for being canceled over there. And uh, it's going all right. So share that stuff around, guys. Let people know who like audiobooks and support the show. America.ca slash support. You got anything else to get into on this? No, I, I think that's about it. You have a bio? Yeah, I'll just uh, I'll just go over this quickly here. So Joanne, like we mentioned, we did a show on her about Edgar Casey. It was fascinating. Uh, for over 35 years, renowned author, speaker, and therapist, Joanne DiMaggio. M-A-C-H-T has pursued a passionate interest in reincarnation research and past life therapy. In in The Inner Light, which is the, her latest book, I'll just read a quick little blurb about this because it's pretty fascinating. How the Beatles planted the spiritual seed in our souls. She sets about to answer that question, pulling from her experience as a Beatles fan club president from 64 to 72 you might say DiMaggio was in the room where it happened, published to coincide with the 60th anniversary of the group's arrival in New York. DiMaggio opens the book with her perspective on how the 60s, the Beatles, and the Catholic Church played a role in her own spiritual evolution. There you have it, guys. And uh, her website is in here. It's joannedimaggio.com. I'll put link. There's links in the show notes. Links in the show notes. As always, it's a good one, guys. Hope you guys enjoy this chat. With uh, the one and only jo- Joanne DiMaggio. Joanne DiMaggio, welcome back to Grey America after three years. I know, it's, it just seems like yesterday. Thanks for inviting me back.
on a special day, of course, and we get to talk about your new book. I, I mean, I don't even know if you had told us that you were writing this. Like, you, you know, usually we kind of talk about like what's upcoming with guests, but it's been three years. So maybe it wasn't even on your radar back then. It may not have been. Um, I don't remember which book we were talking about when we were uh, to go, because I did a book on Edgar Casey and the Unfilled. Unfilled Destiny of Thomas Jefferson Reborn. Yes, right that's the one, yeah. this one. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So what's today? Today is National Beatles Day. Dee, 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 dee. Uh, okay. It's the 60th anniversary of when the Beatles first landed in New York. Oh, okay. 60 years ago today. Cannot believe it. Seems like yesterday. And we did not talk at all about your, I don't think we did, about about your interest in the Beatles and, and being in the fan club and running the fan club. I mean, that's some pretty... Yeah, Pretty amazing this stuff. Of, yeah, this is kind of different for me. Um, it's the first time I've done a book that's partially memoir um, and worked the metaphysical into it uh, as well, and then worked the Beatles into it. Um, I thought about it for a long time, and I just couldn't figure out if if I wanted to do it, and then how I was going to do it. Right, right. And so you know. Um, about two years ago, I sort of really seriously started putting it together. Well, what can we talk about like being in a fan club? Cause nowadays, like, I don't know, are there even fan clubs anymore? Like, it just seems like everything's online. So, I mean, I was just starting to think about what it was like, because I, pr I probably like applied to a couple fan clubs back in the day, maybe, but you know, you'd get things in the mail and I mean, it was yeah. just so different back then. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, um, so. The Beatles came out February of 1964, and I was just one of countless number of teenage girls across the country who um, wanted to be more than just fans. We wanted to have a fan club. And I loved to write, and I was pretty organized. And I liked the idea, even as a young teenager, of, um, of networking, you know, of having like-minded people get together and form friendships and just have fun. And so I thought, oh, I'll start a fan club. And so I started to ask my friends, of course, to join. And um, uh, I, I looked in the back of a lot of the magazines back then, like 16 and um, Tiger Beat, and then Beatles Monthly started coming out. They would have a list of Beatle pen pals. So that was my marketing campaign. I would write letters to Beatle pen, pen pals, say, hey, I've got this fan club, would you like to join? And I decided I would give them a newsletter every month. Um, and of course, you know, back then, it's like I was doing it on my mother's um, old Underwood manual typewriter, one, at, one page at a time. And then I got clever and used carbon paper, which looked terrible. And then I graduated to a mimeograph machine. I mean, we didn't have internet. We didn't have word processing. Uh, so, you know, when I wanted to, to, to do a headline, I would do it with magic marker. It was so, uh, so immature and so unprofessional. But, you know, that's what that's. I used the tools at my disposal and just started to grow the club um, with, uh, based on that. So it was kind of fun in the beginning. And and was there other fan clubs at the time? Like how, how did that whole thing work? Cause I mean, there was a bit of a, a David and Goliath battle between fan clubs and. Yeah, that came a little bit later um, when they organized the uh, Beatles USA limited, which was the national fan club in New York. It was under the auspices of Apple records. And uh, so they were the national fan club. It cost like two fifty a year to join. Um, and but then there were about a hundred independent Beatle fan clubs all across the country. Uh, so there were just you know girls like me in different towns who started their own clubs. Well, the club in New York decided, no, 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 uh, we don't <laughs> want all these little individual fan clubs. We want everybody under under us. You know, we want everybody to join our club and pay that two fifty a, a, a year for membership. And um, and so what happened was we got pretty much what I like to think of as a cease and desist letter uh, telling us, you know, uh, we were actually being threatened 
uh, that we had to um, join join up with them, which meant that we had to convince our members to join the national club in order for us to become a chapter. So um, uh, I I thought that was just wrong. And I thought, I don't know how I'm gonna fight this, but I did enlist the help of, um, of a DJ at WCFL radio in Chicago. Uh, I told him what was going on and he printed my letter in his um, Sunday column in the Chicago Sun-Times. Uh, it was called the Stag Line. His name was Jim Stag, and he he took up our cause for us. And he called New, the New York office. They didn't return his call. So for a while it got quiet, and then uh, down the hammer came again. And eventually, there were only three holdouts, three clubs that were didn't want to, you know, get involved with the National Club. Mine was one of them, but you know. Eventually, we all succumbed. They they offered me the position of national chapter director. I guess they thought it was better for me to join them than fight them. So they could keep an eye on me that way. So it was a, a little carrot that they dangled, and I, and I accepted. So then I had all the clubs across the country actually reporting to me. I was the liaison between the clubs across the country and the club in New York. Oh, that's interesting. All the chapters and the club in New York. So was that all based on, was it money related or was there any, were they trying to control information as well? Like, I mean, it must've been a little weird how they exploded onto the scene shortly after Kennedy died, like that you write about in your book. I mean, it was such a weird time back then, right? I mean, they were taking over the, the airwaves, right? Really? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, yeah, because Kennedy died in November of 63 uh, and the Beatles came to New York in February of 64. So it was only a few months later. And I really think that we were, um, as a generation, we were, we were um, in mourning and we were grieving and we were looking for something to, to pull us out of that. And, uh, you know, the 60s in and of itself, that was a, that was a strange time to be alive, um, you know, both uh, sociologically, um, technology wise, politically uh, and even spiritually. It just seemed like there was something going on. We couldn't quite put our finger on it, but but it was it was a, a different feel to everything. And so here come the Beatles and we all, uh, you know, kind of wrapped our arms around them. And the New York club, um, like I said, this will be a couple of years down the road. Um, I think that they wanted to control information because don't forget, we didn't have internet. All of our information was coming from DJs or from the newspaper or from a magazine article we read or something on the radio, whatever. But it wasn't, sometimes it wasn't at all accurate. So that was going on. There was also a lot of bootleg, uh, photographs being sold and they were trying to control that as well. So there were definite advantages to being a part of the national club in terms of what we could give our members that as an independent club, we, we wouldn't have been able to do, but it was just the whole idea of the way it was handled, the takeover kind of feel to it. But, um, but anyway, it, it turned out, it turned out, uh, uh, I think, um, well, it was ironic because what happened when the clubs ended then, then they went back. They reverted back to being independent clubs when the National Club in New York was was uh, closed in uh, 1972. Then the then these small independent clubs that wanted to stay continue to be fan clubs. Um, they went back to being independent. So we we're right back to square one. <laughs> uh, what was it about 1972? Um, the end of 71 in December, the George Harrison Fan Club put out a newsletter. Now, I have to say this because that fan club was one of the best ones in the country. Um, the president of that fan club knew George Harrison's family. Uh, she was close to his dad and his mom and his sister. That club uh, was doing a lot of good. Uh, they had a fund for Bangladesh. They had uh, adopted a child in Thailand. They had a cancer fund that they had set up. So they were doing a lot of good stuff. But apparently they had put something in one of their newsletters and George read it and he was upset by it, didn't like what he read. Uh, and then basically said, hey, there are no more Beatles. There shouldn't be any more Beatle fan clubs. So he went to Alan Klein, who is their um, 
manager at the time and told them, told them, you know, I, we don't, I don't think there should be any more fan clubs. The other Beatles agreed. And that, as they say, is the end of that. So they, they shut it all down, both oh. in the United States and in, and in England as well. Wow. That's interesting. Yeah. So you mentioned like the, the, the change in the sixties, like spiritually, socially and all that. And I don't even know how to ask this question really, but, and, and you don't have to answer it, but do you ever look back on that time and, and feel like it was sort of uh, engineered in a way? And like, and like, I know, I know there's a lot of, and you've been in the, you've been in this sort of this research, like past lives and reincarnation and all kinds of spiritual healings and all that for so many decades now. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and and I'm, I'm, tr- I'm struggle with this whole thing too. There's a, there seems to be a big pushback against the new age in a way. Like people think it's all a controlled sort of thing, you know, a controlled op which brings in music and counterculture type stuff. Like in the sixties, there was some books written in the late sixties about, um, about the, uh, the Valley in, uh, in California. I'm, 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 I'm forgetting the name of it. Uh, the Canyon weird scenes in the Canyon and the Beatles were before that though, you know, in the, in the sixties. And and I wonder like, do you, do you feel like any of that was sort of engineered any of that, push even towards the spirituality or the new age. Like you, you mentioned in your book, how they changed their, they, they got more spiritual and that ref, was reflected in their music. Does that feel like engineered at all? Or am I just, uh, or, or are people, are people sort of grasping at straws when they try to, to push back against the new age a bit? Well, you know, I don't think anything is random in, in the universe. Um, and um, certainly I address the whole subject of, soul a soul contract between the four of them you know they're part of the same soul family the same soul group that came together and they they address that as well both paul paul uh, and george both talked about uh you know how was it that we came together you know sort of looking for like what was our mission why why did why did all this happen uh, i think it was just a combination of of everything uh, kind of coming together with the Beatles, you could see their music changing drastically year after year after year. I think the first inkling of it going toward a spiritual direction was around 1965, and then of course 66. Then they went to the Maharishi uh, Mahashogi in in India, and you know George was really immersed in that culture and that music. Uh, and wanted to bring that to to us, and so I think it was very subliminal in a in a way. Um, and I don't know that anybody thought I'm deliberately going to do this. I think it just evolved uh, very naturally. And you know, from my perspective, being a reincarnation researcher uh, and therapist, um, I could definitely see the the uh, the purpose the sole purpose of those four souls coming together um and being divinely influenced to uh, provide us with n- the music the lyrics that really moved us gave us permission so to speak to start questioning um everything that we had been taught uh, i grew up catholic uh, 12 years of catholic school um, and I was questioning uh, a lot of what I was being taught about, you know, about sin and, and all of that. And, um, you know, embracing the whole idea of reincarnation changed that for me, made a lot more sense to me. And mm-hmm. I think the Beatles gave me, not only me, but others, um, because I did interview a lot of other Beatle fans for the book and asked them the same question. Uh, and they were um, from all different religions. And they said, yeah, we had a longing inside of us. We were looking for something. And they gave us permissions that it's okay to look, it's okay to explore. And uh, and we did. And I think that's what, uh, when I talk about planting spiritual seeds, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, that makes sense. And I mean, I guess that, I guess if you were, you know, high level of government or intelligence agencies and this phenomena happens, you would want to at least monitor it or keep an eye on it. I mean, it, it, maybe it doesn't even have to be that they're pushing it ahead, but they have to be involved in it somehow, you know, just to uh, just to keep an eye on the culture. I mean, that would make sense, you know, if you're trying to to run the most powerful country in the world, mm-hmm. it's getting kind of like, um, you know, influenced by <laughs> by these I mean, because it was kind of counterculture at the time, right? I mean, it was rock. There was like this oh, rock yeah. and roll kind of stuff, right? 
oh yeah, oh uh, yeah, you know everything about them was counterculture. Look at their haircuts and uh, uh, you know uh, the way they spoke, the way they acted, um, the things that they were doing, you know, and then some of the things that they were saying. Look at what happened when John talked about being more popular than Jesus. Oh my goodness, you know, they thought <laughs> that the you know that a, an earthquake happened and swallowed us all whole. Um, and then when they started experimenting with LSD, uh, that was another milestone. And then, of course, the the music. Uh, and, I, and every time something like that would happen, there would be large numbers of fans that would give up on them completely. Um, and just I know I saw our membership uh, numbers would drop every time there was a a controversy, you know, and uh, whether it was real or not, right? Like you mentioned, because you guys are having to follow the papers and all this, and I could see the fan club getting all upset about all this sort of tabloidy type stuff, which might not even be true or not. But then, of yeah. course, the you know the drugs. I mean, whatever they, you know, they said some of that stuff themselves. They kind of opened up to some of it, so I'm sure there was a lot of people pushing back legitimately. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. you know, like the whole thing about Paul being dead. I mean, I was going to ask you about that. Oh, yeah. Paul, believe that. Oh. You don't think Paul's dead? <laughs> no, I don't. Well, think we're gonna have to get you on with the guy because I don't know. I mean, I'm not saying Paul is dead, but we had someone on a guy. He swears up and down Paul is dead. So we'll have to get you guys on at the same time because <laughs> I'd like to know. It was episode 198 going back to 2016. And it was called uh, Mike Williams, the Sage of Quay or the Sage of Key. And the memoirs of Billy Shears. So it's a guy that like named Billy Shears that, that says... Uh, that he was the replacement of Paul by Bill Shepard, mm -hmm. the cover up and replacement of Paul by Bill Shepard. So you don't think Paul died then? Oh, no, no, I never thought he died. I mean, it was ridiculous to me, you know, but just like I understood what John Lennon meant when he talked about, you know, we're more popular than, the, than Jesus. He didn't, he certainly didn't mean it the way people took it. I mean, right. look what happened. I mean, they were burning albums and banning their music and, and all of that. And he said, Hey, I'm just stating a fact that, that, you know, uh, that we, we mean more to kids than, than Jesus does. And it was a, that's the truth. It was a fact. Yeah. But, um, but people took it, a, you know, the wrong way. And then when they were doing LSD and all of that, it was like, uh, oh, you know, then parents were all in an uproar. And um, so there were, there were moments here and there. They were certainly didn't shy away from controversy. Um, but, you know, so to be a Beatle fan at that time, you know, you just kind of hung in there because <laughs> you never knew what was going to happen next. Um, but we love the group. We love them as individuals and we love the music. And um, I mean, it was to me, one of the saddest days that happened was when they broke up because after that we didn't have the music anymore like we had yeah. before. And, uh, and so funny because kids today, the, the, and I'm talking, when I say kids, I mean, you know, 13, 14 year old kids or younger. Um, they sound a lot like we did in 64. I, I, sometimes I go on the uh, Beatles Facebook pages and, um, and there's that, giddiness that silly kind of oh paul he's so cute you know and i'm thinking how are you saying this 60 <laughs> years like i don't get it i don't get it but they i don't think they have anybody the way we did you know they they really the the music um the music is timeless and it, it speaks to every generation and so um that's why i don't think they'll ever go out of popularity uh they made that that much of a of an imprint on our soul, so to speak. When did they start experimenting with drugs? Was that like in the late sixties or a few years after they came to America? Or? Um, I'm trying to think when that was, I don't remember exactly. It was, yeah. it was in the, um, it was in the later sixties. I wrote it down somewhere, but I don't have it right in front of me. Was there any pushback from, the record labels or their producers or their, their, their controllers, like to not sound more spiritual or to change their sound or like, to, it seems like they kind of just did what they want uh, from what I'm getting. But you know, you, cause you see these, like the movie or the, the, the documentary on queen, for example, or that movie, whatever it was, uh, you know, you, you realize that in the eighties, at least, or in the late seventies, like there seemed to be a real sort of push for radio music and, 
they they almost were forced to to do things a certain way, but I feel like they kind of went their own way, did they? Yeah, I don't think that I don't think that they succumbed to that kind of pressure at all. I think that they were in total charge of what was what was happening. The the uh, the usage of drugs, I think, really started like in '67, but then this when John wrote um, Rain. Uh, which was on the flip side of uh, Paperback Writer. That was in May of 66. And that was the, um, he was in a sort of disoriented state when he wrote it. He had heard some religious, Eastern religious chanting. And he said that that sound reflected his, quote, stone consciousness. So that's when it really started to, uh, uh, to get into high gear. And then Tomorrow Never Knows, which was on um, the album Revolver, it happens to be my favorite too. And that was all based on the Tibetan Book of the Dead. So, um, you know, there were some, um, you know, I think my favorite line there is I'll play the game existence to the end of the beginning. It just, that's a reincarnation statement if I ever heard one. Uh, and so I think those seeds were just being planted. Uh, and I don't, I don't think it was being done. Um, nefariously yeah with any forethought or anything like that i think it was just this is the, this is how they were evolving and you know we were just going along for the ride with them <laughs> darren do you were you a beatles fan at all darren or did you did you no, have no, that I, plan I, in I, your i mean there's small the town. songs i don't mind but uh, definitely not a big beatles fan uh, but I'm wondering what the what do you think it would have been like with the internet? Like, what do you think that, or, or do you think there's anything out there today that's similar? Like, how does sort of maybe the Taylor Swift phenomena or the Elon Musk sort of thing? I don't know what it would have been like if we had had the internet back then. I think maybe uh, we would have reached out to a lot more people. Obviously. Uh, than doing it by snail mail, you know, everything came through the, with my, my friendly mailman every day. <laughs> um, uh, so the information would have gotten to us a lot quicker, obviously, and our, our circle would have expanded considerably, but then, you know, there's the downside of that as well. I mean, who knows how much of that information would have gotten distorted. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it was, uh, was meant to be what it what it ended up being and we did the best that we could with the limited tools that we had those of us that have fan clubs i mean um so um but i don't think anybody is really a- on that level today I-, I wouldn't compare taylor swift her her popularity to the beatles popularity she's in a whole different to me in a whole different realm uh than they are but um and like I said, I don't think anybody today has the same um, impact on, on on us on a spiritual level than the Beatles than the Beatles did and still do. You know, they were like I said in the book, they're planting a seed, they're putting it out there. Especially George Harrison, especially. Um, you know, I couldn't find very many quotes by Ringo Starr about any of this. Uh, I found quite a few from John and maybe some from Paul, uh, but the majority was George. So he was their messenger. He was the one that was, I think, given that job among the four, that he would be the, uh, you know, the the leading messenger of the group in terms of um philosophical ideas and spiritual ideas. It was he do what did they write? I don't even know who wrote all their songs. Was it all of them or him mainly or? Well, you know, they each wrote, um, you know, John and Paul collaborated obviously, but they wrote their own music. I found out, um, I don't know if I've talked about this in previous interviews with you, but uh, there's a form of, um, writing that I teach called soul writing, which yeah, is a written, to... form, a written form of meditation. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's writing while you're in an altered state of consciousness and believe it or not, there are many, many, many very well-respected writers and composers um, who use the same process, which is, you know, accepting um, 
uh, information sort of, they're downloading. Downloading, it. yeah. Downloading yeah. it. And uh, both John and Paul uh, used that method in writing um, some of their music. I found out um, uh, John, when he wrote Across the Universe, um, he um, the lyrics came to him while he was in bed. And he said that it was... Um, that they were purely inspirational and the words were given to him. And that's a sign of soul writing when you feel like it's being given to you and you're just simply writing it down. You're the vessel that it's coming through and then you're writing it down. So um, he did it with that. And he also did it with nowhere, man. Um, he said that that came from his subconscious. Uh, and then Paul did it with yesterday. He, he had said that, um, that the, that song sort of wrote itself uh, like he had, like it came to him in a dream. And then the other one that he did that fell in that category was let it be, uh, that it was, uh, it felt like a visitation to him. So that the, the way they were describing their source of inspiration is basically the way soul writing works. And so I found that was really fascinating since I, uh, I didn't know that about them. And, and that's something that I, I write about and I teach, uh, other people had to do that form of writing. Yeah, yeah. Did they were they talking about it way back then, or did, was this something that came out later on? Do you think, like decades after the? Fact? I don't know when. I don't know when they were asked about you know how this music came about. Um, I think with across the universe, I think John was talking about that pretty much around the same time that the music was uh, was made. And same thing, I think for yesterday, I don't think it was like, Oh, I'll write this and then I'll analyze it 10 years later. Uh, you know, I think that they, they knew right then and there that this was um, coming to them a little bit differently than, than the other music. Um, yeah. You know, and George talked about needing to be in a quiet place, kind of shut the world out when he was doing his writing as well. But um, I was surprised that he didn't talk more about that process of him writing, but I couldn't really find very many quotes from him regarding that. Yeah. Interesting how he was the messenger. He was the one deeper, deeper into it, but they were the ones practicing that part of it, like actually putting it into work. Right. Right. Yeah. I just wondered if I, I was just curious about like, if they were, if they felt comfortable enough to talk about that, I guess back then, you know, that might be, that might have come across weird in the sixties, but then again, maybe not. It was the sixties, and everything was everything was weird. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, I mean, uh, you know, when I was doing my research for the book and I was looking at um, at their quotes, uh, I found uh, they had quite a few songs that they wrote that referenced reincarnation. Um, uh, besides, tomorrow never knows. Uh, I want to tell you, the, it was, um, I could wait forever, I've got time, uh, maybe next time around. Those are the lyrics from that song. It's all too much, um, floating down the stream of time, of life to life with me. Um, it was it was all there. It was all in front of us, but we didn't put two and two together. I didn't put two and two together. It took me 15 years between the time the, the, the Beatles disbanded and the time that I started my esoteric career in 1987, uh, when Shirley MacLaine came out on Out on the Limb, that's when I started my um, my career uh, in in metaphysics. Um, but I didn't, you know, I didn't put two and two together until, like I said, many many years later. But it was there; it was right in front of us. We just didn't know how to piece it together. But I still think it influences us. I mean, I think whether we understand what those lyrics are or not as kids or as teenagers or when they're really popular, I think it, you know, it does, I think, play a part in our subconscious and it, it probably helps people wake waking up. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, you know, like I said, it's just planting seeds that blossom. Who knew when it was going to blossom? You know, it just was sort of dormant in me for all those years. And uh, but because, you know, I was reading about. Um, esoteric topics before the Beatles came out. When I was maybe 10, 11 years old, I was already reading books about reincarnation. I read, the first book I read was The Search for Bridie Murphy, which was written in 1956. I didn't read it in 56, but that's when it was, that's when it came out about a woman who um, 
you know, said that she had lived, she was hypnotized and she was a housewife and lived in the 19th century Ireland and everything that, that she said, her whole experience just made so much sense to me, uh, you know, coming out of, um, you know, the Catholic church and what we were being taught then uh, and, and did, did make sense to me. A lot of it didn't make sense to me, but this whole theory of, um, karma, because I started reading books by Jeff Stern and Ruth Montgomery and books about Edgar Casey, and suddenly I, the light bulb went off and then, oh, this makes so much more sense than, than what I was being taught. Um, and so I was immersed in that when I was that young, but then when the Beatles came along, I put it all in the back burner, didn't think much about it until, like I said, you know, until 1987, and then here comes Shirley MacLaine with Out on a Limb, the mini series that was on ABC for two nights. And uh, she's talking about reincarnation and channeling and all of that. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember I was reading about that when I was a kid. And so I just jumped right back into it and have been with it ever since. But I always wondered, always was nagging me. How did I go from being passionate about the Beatles to being passionate about reincarnation studies? Because as I said in my book, there was nothing in my childhood, in my background that would uh, indicate that I even knew anything about, um, you know, metaphysical topics. I mean, I grew up in a South side of Chicago, very blue collar neighborhood, Italian American family. Um, nobody talked about reincarnation or anything like that. So I thought, how did that happen then? How it made no sense to me. So that's what that was sort of the impetus for me to do the research on this book because I really wanted to piece it together for myself. You know, what what made Joanne tick? You know, what what were the influences that have um sort of converged on me and, and and now I am who I am and this is what I'm doing and this is why I'm here. Uh, but what brought me here? What, what was the path that I took and who was with me along that path? So um, that was the whole reason I wrote the book was just do that sort of introspective journey to find out why. And yet you also brought other people in too from the fan clubs, right? You talk, you do interview some other people about how it changed their lives, right? I did because I wanted to see if I, you know, was I the only one was, was this, and if I was the only one, then what's the sense of writing this book? Um, so I cast a net out to uh, other Beatle fans and I said, is anybody, any of you, have you followed a spiritual path that you can tie back to you being a Beatle fan in the sixties? And so I included 10 different people in the book. They came from all religious backgrounds we all had basically the same story, you know, um, that they were searching for something, that things didn't make sense to them. So it wasn't necessarily that they were Catholic. I mean, there were quite a few Protestant uh, fans in there as well. And, you know, and then the time period we were in, they talked a lot about, you know, what it was like to grow up in the 60s. And uh, so it didn't happen just to me. And there were at least four of them who ended up, doing the same thing I did and, and going to the Edgar Casey's ARE Association for Research and Enlightenment in Virginia Beach and studying the Casey readings and and um, really sort of getting our, our, our education that way uh, about metaphysical studies. Um, one of them became the head of Atlantic University, which is where I got my master's degree uh, in transpersonal studies. So, um, so yeah, it wasn't just me. <laughs> there were quite a few others. Oh, Darren, do you got any questions? Um, do you think, uh, I mean, I wonder if, uh, I wonder if they were like, like, it's really like, I guess they were maybe on their personal journey. It was planting seeds that way. Um, what about, do you think it, like, is it, it kind of ended weird, you know, is that, is it, could it have kept going? Because, you know, some of these bands kind of keep going into their, too old maybe you know and then you kind of have some more respect for the ones that don't do it but you know so in some ways do you think maybe the breakup was was you know obviously it sucked at the time but do you think they would have like ruined it if they would have just kept making albums 
No, I think I would think it would take us to a whole different level. I mean, I think it was cut off prematurely for sure. I mean, there was, you know, yeah, they did excellent work on their own, but it never matched the level of uh, what they did as a group. The sound wasn't the same. Um, the depth wasn't the same. I mean, it just wasn't, it was never the same after that. Um, what I found really interesting though, was, you know, as they're kind of going off on their own, um, you know, what are they thinking about? What are they doing? They, you know, when they had gone to the, see the Maharishi, uh, a lot of us in the fan club, uh, we didn't resonate at all to that, uh, that sound that the, uh, the sitar, and the other, um, just the whole sound of that, of Eastern music, it was like, nah, we don't get it. What are you guys doing? Um, and then, of course, you know, they left rather abruptly. But that, the fact that they learned transcendental meditation, that they did bring in with them all through the rest of their lives. Paul did. I know George did. I know John did. And there was a lot that I found out about John and, and Yoko that really, um, very much surprised me how they were into numerology. They were into tarot. They were into, they were into past lives. Um, John thought that he and Yoko were the um, reincarnation of Robert uh, Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Uh, they collected Egyptian artifacts. Uh, John was working with Kundalini energy. They were into astrology. Uh so many things. They talked about predestination. They talked about karma. Um, just, just there's a, a wealth of quotes from them that 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 uh, indicate where their journey was um, in terms of their own spiritual development. What did break them up? Why why did they break up? I don't even know. I don't even think I know what happened. I don't know that anybody knows one single event that happened. Um, I mean, if you watch the movie, uh, the documentary, Let It Be, you can see the strain in, in the group. Uh, there was just a lot of stuff going on in terms of them getting along. Um, you know, I uh, when Yoko came into the picture, Linda Eastman came into the picture, uh, uh, those in the fan club were very judgmental. We were. I mean, I, I cringe at some of the things that I that were in the newsletters that I published, uh, the things that we we said about them. But it definitely shifted the energy um, of the group, and and I think that um, uh, one thing led to another, and there wasn't a stabilizing effect. You know, when Brian Epstein, their original manager, was alive, he was the glue that held them together. He was like their father figure, and then he died, and you know, nobody really came forward to um, to take on that role with them. So, um, so there was a lot of business related issues that had come up. Uh, you know, so I don't think it was one thing in in particular, one incident. I think it was a very slow death. And finally, you know, Paul said, "I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to." you know, be a part of this anymore. And the others followed suit. They were all doing their own thing. And, you know, they just decided that's it. There's no more Beatles. I, don't know I mean, it must be, them. even in a best case scenario, it would be hard to stay together being so famous. I mean, this is extraordinarily famous, the most famous, you know, musicians ever probably. So it would be hard no matter what you would think to just keep it going with, you know, without people, you know, getting you know, too big in their britches or getting into drugs or getting addicted or drinking, or, I mean, there's so many things that can go wrong. Yeah. And also each one of them individually was an artist unto himself. It wasn't yeah. like um, some other groups where they're all sort of in a support position. There's like specifically one. Specifically. Yeah. Yeah. But with them, it was like, there are four extremely talented standalone kind of artists and, uh, uh, which is why they went on to have, um, you know, uh, uh, independent careers. Uh, and George and Ringo are still performing and they're in their 80s. Pretty remarkable. Um, so, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I can only imagine what music we were robbed of because they opted to not be together anymore. And when was that? Um, 71, 72. Oh, was that early? Uh-huh. 
Oh, I didn't even know that. I thought it was way later than that. So, and when did the manager die? Like in the close to that, like 70, 60? No, it was, it was, I don't remember the exact year that yeah. Brian died. They were in, uh, I think they were in India at the time. So I think, wow. then, um, yeah. In the and, they, and they all went to India. Together. They all, all four wow. of them went. Uh, Ringo didn't last long. I think he lasted two weeks. <laughs> And he said he didn't like the food and he and his wife went back home. And then Paul and Jane Asher, who was girlfriend at the time, they left. And then John left and George left. They, they, uh, I didn't know that the, that song, Sexy Sadie, I didn't realize it was about the Maharishi. <laughs> we were very naive, we fans. Um, they were claiming that, you know, there was some dilly-dallying going on over there at the um, ashram. But uh but like I said, out, out, what they did get out of it, as far as that learning transcendental meditation, they were able to apply to their lives um, later on. Uh, but yeah, so 1972 was um, the end of 71, early 72 is when the fan clubs uh, disbanded. Wow. And so it was, it was quite a fast, really. It was quite a fast phenomenon, really, like from 64. 64 yeah. to 72 that's kind of when your timeline is in the book too that's yeah. only eight years i mean that goes by like nothing yeah kind of gave us whiplash but that's the way it worked out darren do you have any questions well, i must be exciting kind of waiting for the mailman and stuff like that i mean <laughs> now it's just like now everything's so instant i mean it must have been it must oh, yeah. have been kind of myth part of that you know I do you have any sort of part? Do you have like a, I mean, a Beatles telegram or like, you know, a, a group, Facebook groups or anything like that? Do you have any sort of thing like that sort of carrying on? Oh, there's a lot of Facebook groups that are still out there. There are a lot of the people that I knew who are, um, uh, who, who've written books about the years with the fan club, the, the woman who is the head of the George Harrison fan club, the one I mentioned about her newsletter being the one that, um, unfortunately was the one that uh, George saw. Um, she wrote a whole book about the, the, what happened with her fan club. And there was another book that came out fairly recently about the North American fan club. So yeah, there are a lot of, we've lost a lot of the, the people that I knew over the years um, are gone. I still am in touch with some uh, that were in high school with me. Uh, who were uh, who were part of the club for at least a little while, um, yeah. So it's uh, you know it's been an interesting ride, and uh, I have a lot of memorabilia uh, from that time. Um, uh, things that the club sent, the national club sent us gifts at Christmas time. There's a Beatles Christmas album that we got. I have some original photographs. Um, so um, uh, magazines from that time period, the Beatles Monthly, a lot of that stuff uh, I have, I've kept. And I doubt that my children are going to fight over it because <laughs> I don't know that either one, either one of them is going to want any of that. But there it is. I've kept it all. I have all my newsletters, too, from, 70, uh, from 64 to 72. And so uh, I, when I was doing the research on this book, I was going through those newsletters. And like I said, some of it was really cringeworthy. Oh, <laughs> I, I had to forgive myself. I had to say, you were only a kid. It's okay. You know, you, you didn't know any better. But, um, um, you know, this is part of who we were. So were you just like printing out a bunch of newsletters and mailing them out? Yeah, I would do one newsletter at a time because I didn't have like a copier. Yeah, I didn't. I went and bought I mean, a mimeograph. I, I don't know if people remember what mimeograph machines were like. So you had to type a, a stencil, blue stencil. Then you had a drum, and you put black ink all over the drum, and then you put the stencil over the drum, and then you were one. You were <laughs> cranking out one newsletter at a time, and the quality was awful. I mean, some of it you could hardly read. Some of it was too dark. Some of it was too light. Um, I did that for a while until. Uh, I got a Smith Corona electric portable typewriter. I thought, was, <laughs> boy, I was really doing well. And, um, and then I, um, you know, I found out that I could take it down to a, 
print a copier and they would make copies and you could actually read the whole thing. And I'd staple them and I'd fold them and put a, a stamp on them and take them to the post office. <laughs> did you pay for all that yourself or how did you do? You, no, I did it all myself. I did it myself. And, you know, I, so I did this all through high school. I started in eighth grade, did it all through the four years of high school. And then I was doing it when I was actually in college too. So I was taking a full load of courses at the university of Illinois. I was working part-time as a legal secretary to help me get through school. And I was, coming home and not only doing my schoolwork, but running this fan club. And so I would be up late at night down in the basement, answering fan mail and, and <laughs> processing, um, processing uh, uh, requests for po photographs. We were selling pictures, you know, and, um, and other things. So it was, you know, it was kind of interesting, kind of fun. Some of it wasn't so much fun. I mean, there was a lot of infighting within the club. A lot of hate mail was coming my way. Um, you know, and then we had the factions. You have the anti-Yoko people, the pro-Yoko people, the anti-Linda people, the pro-Linda. And it just, it, and it got, it really got out of hand. And then I had the official Paul McCartney fan club. My club kept changing its name. It kept morphing into something else. And eventually I had the Paul McCartney fan club. And um, when when there were no more Beatles, they were trying to have the the official Beatles fan club became the Apple Tree, uh, meaning that um, if if there was an Apple recording artist, we could have a fan club for them. And so Paul was the Apple recording artist, but so was Linda. And so for me, it was like your club has to be for both of them. And I said, no, I didn't sign up for that. So, uh, so I ended up giving the club away. Uh, but this was around the time that they all disbanded anyway. And so whoever took over my club, I remember it was a woman that lived in Indianapolis. I was in Chicago at the time and she came out and I gave her boxes and boxes and boxes of, of, uh, materials and, and she left. And after that, my mail stopped, the phone stopped ringing. It was, I went cold Turkey, <laughs> you know, after that, um, and my father was real happy because he thought, you know, it's about time I grew up and gave but that's, up. That's like, awesome, though. I mean, what a what an amazing lesson for all the young people today that you're just going after it. I mean, you're going to school, you're doing this fan club, you're managing this, you're working, you're doing everything you can. I mean, all you Gen Zs and young millennials, listen up to how it was done back then. That's how it was done. We just <laughs> kept going. Of course, I, I had no life. You know that, don't you? <laughs> I didn't date or do any things that other normal teenagers did. But uh, but anyway, yeah, it was. I mean, you know, I really learned a lot that I was then able to apply to my life later on. Uh, conflict resolution was one of the big ones. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. And I guess it must have prepared you in some ways for your, like, you know, even subconsciously for your career in metaphysics. I mean, it's really interesting how much you've done as an adult in metaphysics, too. Yeah, I mean, the whole idea of networking, I continued that well into my metaphysical career. Uh, you know, I started a, a healing center. Um, I had a past life research organization. Uh, I, I hosted meetings and conferences and things like that. I did do a newsletter. I love doing newsletters. And of course, then I honed my writing skills. And then that uh, went right into my um, the book writing that I've done and uh, the speaking engagements. You know, I hosted Beatle fan club meetings downtown Chicago at, at some of the most prestigious hotels. You know, when I was in my teenage years, I was at the... Uh, you know, at the Palmer House and the Executive House hosting hosting meetings down there. And, uh, you know, and then I went to New York and I, when I was like 19, I, I went to New York and went up to Apple Records. I have pictures of me up in their offices and um, uh, went to the Bangladesh concert that George uh, hosted. Uh, and so, you know, there are many memorable, memorable moments um, that really, I learned a lot. It was the school of hard knocks for sure. Yeah. And, I, and I brought that forward into who I am today. Yeah. What you mentioned one, one part of the book I want to ask you about is your, the car, the car accident and, uh, and how you lost yourself for a few years there. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, I was, and how that was part of the book kind of. Yeah. Like, I was, or, yeah. Um, well, I was in a car accident 
uh, and uh, I had a near-death experience as a result of that. And for three years, I uh, I had sort of a metaphysical amnesia. I didn't remember. I mean, I, I remembered everything, but I didn't care about it anymore. And so for three years, um, you know, three years, I was just kind of trying to live a mainstream kind of life. I gave everything up. I gave up my membership in ARE. I gave up my past life organization. I got rid of all my books. Oh, my God. And then three years to the date of that accident, I woke up and I was back. All the all the emotional charge that was who I had been before was back. And I'm looking around. I'm going, oh, what did I do? Where Where is all all of my books. And so then the next three years, I'm trying to figure out what the heck happened. And then uh, while I was at, uh, I enrolled at Atlantic University, which is a, a, a school that was started by uh, Edgar Casey at the same time that he formed the Association for Research and Enlightenment. And I went into their uh, Masters of Transpersonal Studies program because I thought, well, this will get me right back into it again, you know. And so um, the very last class I took was on near-death experience. And uh, I had a conversation with PMH Atwater, who is a, an expert in that topic. She happened to go to the Unity Church I was going to. And she's the one who told me that I had had a, a near-death experience at that moment of impact in that when I was in that car accident. And, uh, and that um, a, a disassociation from your previous life is a symptom of that. So then it finally made sense. It took me quite a while. And then after that, I just sort of rebuilt my life um, and got even deeper into my metaphysical studies. So yeah, everything has a purpose and a reason. It may take a while <laughs> for it to manifest, but in my case, it did. Hmm. What do you think? Uh... What do, if what if the Beatles wouldn't come around? Like, what do you think? What was the runner-up? What would your passion have been if you wouldn't have fallen sort of into this lifelong Beatles thing? Oh, I probably would have been a history professor because <laughs> I loved history. But um, uh, which you know, in a way, I, I'm doing that when I do my past life work with my clients. Uh, they're taking me to every time period conceivable when they when they do their past life regressions. And so, um, you know, so I'm combining that with the soul writing that I learned from Edgar Casey. He called it inspirational writing and I termed it soul writing, uh, which I think is one of the most transformative tools I've ever learned. So um, so I don't know. I mean, I think that. Um, when I was in college, they were discouraging us from being teachers because it was during the Vietnam War. And um, a lot of the the, the boys that were, in, they were, to avoid being drafted, they became teachers. And so the, the market was flooded with teachers. And so we were being told, don't go into that field. But I, I probably would have done that uh, if I hadn't been preoccupied <laughs> with the Beatles. <laughs> Thank God for the Beatles. Oh yeah. Who's your favorite who what's your favorite song? Mine? Yeah, if you had tomorrow, to tomorrow never knows. Tomorrow never knows. I love that. I, I blast it when I play it. Uh and the, the the words are just, you know, relax and float downstream. You know, play the game existence to the end of the beginning. That's all about what I do. <laughs> and what about a favorite beetle? Definitely George. Definitely George. I, I I would give anything if he were still with us to sit and tie, but we could talk for hours, really. Um, yeah, but um, that's not the case. Uh, could try doing some soul writing with him maybe sometime. I haven't I haven't done that, but uh, yeah. I mean, I made when I was younger when I was a early first became a Beatle fan. Ringo is my favorite. I think at one point they all were, I think with the exception of John, John intimidated me too much. <laughs> so I didn't, uh, I didn't really resonate with him that much, but, um, but, you know, as an adult now looking back, it would have been George for sure. So what do you got coming up? Are you still doing your past life uh, healings and stuff like that? Oh, or, yeah. or what else, what else yeah. do you got? Anything else after now that this book is out? Cause it just, yeah. it just came out in January, right? Yeah, that's right. It's only been out a few weeks. Um, I'm working on a book that I'm calling why are there so many Cleopatras? Uh, 
Uh-huh. And, other, and other commonly asked questions about reincarnation. Because over the years, I've been doing this work now for 37 years. And um, the same kind of questions come up over and over again. People are wondering, you know, what's the difference between a soulmate and a twin flame? Or, um, you know, um, all kinds of, what are the Akashic records? Uh, uh you know, all kinds of questions like that. So I, I'm taking the top questions and I'm creating somewhat of an anthology of uh, doing research on what other leading past life uh, experts uh, uh, have said about that particular topic. And so then you could just, you know, go to that chapter if you want to understand about uh, soul contracts or soul families, and you can read that that part of it. So um I've been working on that for a while, uh, whenever I can kind of get to it. I was thinking of doing a book about soulmates. Um, I might do that. Uh, I don't know. We have to see how much time the universe is going to give me uh, <laughs> to be to be doing all of this. And I am still seeing clients. Uh, I do have people want to go to my website, which is joannedemajo.com. You could look under uh, services and you'll see the different types of past life regressions I offer or a soul writing uh, class, if you're interested in that, you can sign up uh, through my online calendar. So uh, between that and doing um, interviews like this and podcasts and speaking at conferences and things like that, I've been keeping myself pretty busy. It seems like the whole field is still growing. Would you say that it's, it's still becoming more and more popular, even though there's a bit of a, like, there's also a counter current against sort of new age I don't know if that's coming from sort of like the new people that are going into Christianity or this new new interest in in Christ, but I do feel like there's a, a bit of that too. But it, it's I still feel like this whole thing is is getting becoming more accepted. There's more science behind it. There's more there's more people doing it. Would you say it's still growing? I I, I don't know. I mean, I don't really have my finger on it because I'm. Uh, but judging by the fact that I'm getting people from all over the world because I do all of my sessions on Zoom. So I can work with people in any country uh, on the on the planet, and and they're all they all have the same needs. They all have the same goals. They all have the same questions. They're all at wondering why am I here? What's the purpose of life? Uh, so um, so I I, uh, I I'm always humbled. Uh, when I work with these people, especially uh, when they have a major breakthrough. And with past life work, you know, you only usually need one session. It's not like traditional psychotherapy that you have to go over and over and over again. One session usually does it because you get to the core of what's going on. What's the what's the core of the um um the root cause of of whatever issue you're dealing with. Did it did it originate in a prior lifetime and you brought it in with you and you're working it through. So, um, so it's fascinating and it's humbling and uh, very healing work. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very, um, I'm very honored that, that I was given this opportunity to do that in this lifetime. Right on. That's a good spot to wrap it up. Absolutely. Joan, this has been great. Where can people find everything? Where's the old book? Where's the new book? If they want to get into the past life stuff, do you have any social media, all that stuff? All the books are on Amazon. Um, I do have a Facebook page. Uh, it's in my name. And um, and you can go to my website, joandamajo.com. And my books are on there. I have a blog. I do a monthly newsletter. You can sign up for that. All of my speaking engagements are on there. The classes that I offer are on there. Uh, so, um, and, you know, I'm, I, ha- I answer all my emails. So if anybody has a specific question, I'm happy to answer them. Right on. Thanks. Good luck with the book. Thank you. Pleasure to be with you again, especially today. Yeah, yeah. 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 Thanks. Thank Good you. Time. Have a great night. You too. Bye-bye. And that was a chat. Joanne DiMaggio. I forgot we had her on a long, a long time ago. Yeah. What'd yeah. you think? Yeah, it was, it was fun. It was making me think of Led Zeppelin though, because I feel like I, I, I feel like Led Zeppelin took, took a lot of that on after the Beatles, you know, they are really doing this obscure esoteric uh, lyrics and, and, and writing and music. And of course, Jimmy Page was, yeah, had a place in Loch Ness that was Crowley's own Crowley's family's place or something like that. Like they were deep into it as well. 
almost probably more from a cult side than a new age side. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I still think Paul's dead. (laughs) I know I was going to ask her about the size differences and all those arguments, but it sounded like she's just not, she, she was pretty solid in her, like, you know, (laughs) I thought she didn't, what, what better person to ask, right? The, the, the head of one of the fan clubs. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So big thanks to Joanne for coming on the show. Big thanks to you guys for listening. Uh, even bigger thanks to your supporter. I mean, we don't have a lot, but we'd like to have more. So head over to grandamerica.ca slash support today. Sign up for a monthly or make a one-time donation. Of course, you, you make a one-time donation uh, over 50 bucks. We'll read out your note on the show or in the intros. And uh, even if you're an old supporter and you've contributed that much or more, then, uh, you know, then we'll read your note too. Just email us and let us know. But we're trying to... um honor our supporters in that way in the hopes of a honoring them and b maybe drumming up some more support. So, you know, grammarica.ca slash support. If you'd like to do that, of course, if you wonder what happens to the outlawed feed, sometimes when we're doing them on YouTube, it's because the second half is for members only. We can't do that on YouTube because we're not allowed to monetize. So we have to do that on other platforms. Check out grammaricaoutlaw.ca for all that sort of the roundup and all that stuff, which we'll have one later tonight. And uh, all those other more controversial interviews, Adult Brain Publishing. There's a YouTube channel. There's a podcast. There's audiobooks for sale. Any place you can get podcasts. Check all of that stuff out for sure. Spam Graham. Let us know what's good, what's not, who we should have on the show. And uh, I think that's about it. Other than that, we love you guys. Thanks for listening. And we will see you next week. Your pupils, your